Good afternoon. Thank you, Natalia, for the kind introduction. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, our organizer, for the invitation. For me, it's a great pleasure to be here. Today, I'm going to talk about how you can use chlorophyll fluorescence to investigate physiological process in plants. I'm from Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul. Mato Grosso do Sul is one state located in the central west of the, of the country. You have a lot of beautiful, na uh, natural beautiful. Pantanal is located in the Mato Grosso do Sul states. More than 7% is located in Mato Grosso do Sul, but there is another part in Mato Grosso. It's another state. Pantanal there, there has a lot of diversity, different kind of animals. It's a good place to visit if you have the opportunity. And Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul, it's one young institution. It's 40 years old only. And as you can see, you like football there. Okay, there is a big stadium. <laughs> uh, I'm a professor at the, op, in the Opticals and Photons group. You have two, three professors, one technician, and several students, PG, master students, and undergraduate students as well. You have facilities involving optics device, different kind of techniques you can use there. And our research interests, you can, I can divide in three parts. One is involving analytical methods. You use optical device, optical techniques to develop analytical process, especially involving biodiesel and ethanol. We also work in the optical spectroscopy to characterize um, photophysical properties of new materials developed by different partners. And also biophotonic. And today I'm going to talk about chlorophyll fluorescence related to some problems that could be interest to the environment. And here is the outline of the presentation. I will start with basic concepts of chlorophyll fluorescence. And then I move to the effects of nanoparticle implants. I'm trying to motivate you in this subject, in this topic. And of course, in the end, I'm going to show how chlorophyll fluorescence can be applied to monitor and investigate the physiological process in plants. So, you need to start about talking about chlorophyll fluorescence, but you need to talk about photosynthesis, because the photosynthesis, it's a very important process for the life in the Earth, as you know. So, not only for the gas exchange, but for the food production, for different kind of animals, and even for humans. And chlorophyll, it's a main photosynthetic pigment involved in this process. So you need to, to connect how chlorophyll works, how chlorophyll play in this process. So I will start to talk about that. Of course, different photosynthetic pigments are important in photosynthesis, but as I will show in the next slide, chlorophyll A is the most important pigment. The uh, pigments are able to collect energy, collect light from sun in a wide range, 
But in green leaves, the photosynthetic pigments absorb light, but other pigments transfer energy to chlorophyll A, and only chlorophyll A drive the photosynthesis, okay? The nature, it's working this way, and carotenoids and other photosynthetic pigments, and chlorophyll B is no accessory pigment, and chlorophyll e, A, sorry, is the primary photosynthetic pigment. Of course, during the light absorption by chlorophyll, not only photosynthesis, photochemistry process can occur, fluorescence can occur as well, and heat, liberation of energy as heat to the environment. So chlorophyll fluorescence are, is closely related to the photosynthesis process. And you, can, and you can use the fluorescence of green leaves to try to understand what has happened during the photosynthesis. In fact, you, we have a um, spectrum with different contributions. And the fluorescence of green leaves is the range of, in, in the visible light. Two main contributions here is in the blue and green range, and the red and far red range. And different pigments, not only the photosynthetic pigments, can fluoresce in green leaves. Some examples of them. But as I told before, only chlorophyll A fluoresce in this region in vivo, when you get the spectral in vivo. So it's very important for us, this information, OK? Chlorophyll B is able to fluoresce here, but not in vivo, only in a extract, pigment extract. But in vivo, only chlorophyll A. It's very important for us, this information, OK? So, now you have two important information to start to building our concept about chlorophyll fluorescence and how chlorophyll fluorescence can be used to evaluate the photosynthetic performance in plants. One, only chlorophyll A is observed in the red infrared region in the spectrum. There are two bands, but it's only the contribution of chlorophyll A. And only chlorophyll A is the pigment that drives the photosynthesis. Of course, if I can get the chlorophyll fluorescence in the right way, you can use the chlorophyll fluorescence to evaluate the photosynthesis process. Here is just to show how you can use the steady state fluorescence to investigate plants using chlorophyll fluorescence. In fact, you have two bands of chlorophyll A fluorescence, but the contribution of these two bands is related with the location of the chlorophyll inside the leaves. In the chloroplast, you have the photosystem 2 and photosystem 1, and the chlorophyll fluorescence spectrum obtained from chlorophyll inside photosystem, photosystem 2 is different from the chlorophyll fluorescence obtained from the chlorophyll internalized, located in photosystem 1. So here you can see that fluorescence obtained from chlorophyll inside the photosystem 2 contribute to the fluorescence in the red and the far head, but the chlorophyll located in photosystem 1 contribute most here in the far head region, OK? Using this information and to the photosynthesis occur, the electrons can move through this way and need to move the electron move to the photosystem 2, to the photosystem 1, you can use 
this, the ratio of these two bands to understand what is happening during the photosynthesis or how the photosynthetic um, apparatus is working. Here, just to show some examples that we got in Mato Grosso do Sul, you can use this ratio here from the head and far red fluorescence, for example, to monitor the water stress response in an easy way, and even to differentiate the behavior of conventional and transgenic plants, okay? Because when plants are under stress, the photosystem two and photosystem one work in a bad way and the fluorescence intensity can change. Here is another example that you use the chlorophyll fluorescence, steady state fluorescence to monitor some pesticide. Here is the glyphosato. And uh, you can see that glyphosato um, affects the function of photosystem one. Photosystem one or more affected. So you can see the alteration. And if you use the ratio of photosystem one and photosystem two fluorescence, you can monitor this. Even uh, you can make one relation to investigate the concentration of the glyphosate. And uh, another uh, application, we use also this fluorescence ratio to identify if golden nanoparticles can, can alter the function of the photosynthetic apparatus. Okay, you can use the steady state fluorescence, but there are some limitations. Um, and those limitations you can overcome using one different approach. You can use one system that you collect the fluorescence mainly for photosystem two, but you need to collect this fluorescence as a function of the time. And two different situations. Who want to uh, know more details about that? Talita, you presented this poster, and you can talk with her. But the main idea, the process is more complicated than that, but I will simplify. You need to perform the chlorophyll fluorescence in the dark when plants are dark adapted in this moment, and when plants are doing photosynthesis, are performing photosynthesis, photosynthesis occurring. So in, this, in those situations, here you can get why do the fluorescence measurement in this situation. In this situation, when plant is dark adapted, there is no photosynthesis. So you can monitor, in this situation, all chlorophyll Electrons are in the growth state, no fluorescence, there is no, sorry, there is no uh, photosynthesis, and you can test the fluorescence minimal and the maximum fluorescence that you can get from the photosystem too. And in this situation, when you turn on the light, the plant start to produce chemical energy the photochemist process started to happen, and the chlorophyll fluorescence intensity started to go down, okay? In these two cases, you can get a lot of information, different parameter here that I'll show in the next slide. And in this case, you can correlate, direct these parameters with the physiological process in plants, okay? For example, this one good parameter for us, FVFM. With FVFM, you can determine the quantum efficiency of photosystem two operation. So the photochemistry process 
can be evaluated if the plant is working normal or not using this parameter. And the NPK, PQ, is no photochemical quenching, so this parameter is related to the uh, loss of energy by RIT. So you can get some information, some parameters, when you perform the chlorophyll fluorescence measurement as a function of the time, and you can correlate these parameters with physiological process in plants. So you get more information and more precise information when compared to the steady state fluorescence, okay? Of course, that the most common uh, system, the simple system, you can use remotely, but most of the system, you just get the fluorescence from one spot in the leaf. And sometimes it's a problem because some disease or some uh, response for plants, for some stress, you measure in one spot, but you are not able to detect because the response could be in the other part of the leaf. So now we are able to collect the fluorescence of the row leaf. It's much better because you can see each pixel is related with the fluorescence parameter. So the pixel here, I can say that can see that FVFM, the photosystem 2, is not working properly in that point, okay? You can get uh, a big advance in terms of the analysis of the plants to evaluate different stress. Now, I need to talk why you are interested to investigate nanoparticles effect on plants. Why nanoparticles? You know that there are a lot of beneficial applications of nanoparticles, but there are some concerns about the use of nanoparticles. I am trying to show you and to, to motivate about this issue here. First, we, uh, we, we are involved in a big project with the uh, University of Essex, University of California, UC Davis, and the Leibniz University, where we intend, our main objective is to develop new nanomaterials to beneficial applications. One of them, to using photocatalytic process to degradate persistent organic pollutants. Another application, use nanoparticles to, to produce energy, by the artificial, artificial photosynthesis, and also to apply the nanomaterials in the photodynamic inactivation of multi-resistant bacteria. But those applications may use nanoparticles, but in, in one safe condition. So another objective is to evaluate the harmful potential of the nanoparticles that will be produced during this project. And I'm involved in this part. Just basic ideas about nanoparticles, basic concept. But one definition that nanoparticle is material with at least one dimension under 100 nanometers. And just to be one idea, one nanoparticle is for the football, as the football is for the earth. Just to one idea. And what makes nanoparticles different from the large particle, from the book? Why it's important to investigate nanoparticles, the arms potential of nanoparticles? Because nanoparticles behave very different from the book of the same composition, in special because the Nanoparticle has a large amount of atoms in the surface, just to be aware about that. One nanoparticle here of, of 30 nanometers, you have 5% of the atoms in the surface, but one nanoparticle of 4 nanometers, 50% of the particles 
are in their surface. So this makes nanoparticles more reactive and in some situations more toxic than the, the bulk material. So even if the, the element is not toxic in a bulk, only for the reduction of the size, the material can be toxic. So it's very important to evaluate the toxicity of nanoparticles. Of course, the toxicity depends on the size, the shape, the chemical composition, OK? But the size, it's one important variable that should be tested. Just one example of the dramatic change of the properties of nanoparticles, you can see here, only moving the size of the particle from 2 to 8 nanometers, the optical characteristic of the material is totally different. It's only the size. Only the size, OK? Of course, these unique properties of nanoparticles make them a good opportunity to develop innovative materials, uh, innovative applications, and new opportunities to create new materials and new products. So it's an uh, important area and should be explored. In fact, there are today, there are a lot of materials that use nanoparticles in their composition. Here, it's some examples in clothes, OK? Most of them are in health and fitness, but they are in the, in the good for children, in the electronic, automotive. There are different applications. And just to show how grown, how fast is growing the nanoparticles application, you can see here that 2005, it's fifth product, commercial product. It's product in the market that people are buying and using, OK? And nowadays, today, more than 1,600 product has nanoparticle in their composition. So one concern is growing as well, because the growing use of nanoparticles means that, inevitable, the nanoparticle amount that will be liberated in the nature, it's growing as well, OK? And in most of the case, the fate and behavior are largely unknown. In fact, the use of nanoparticles, the application of nanoparticles, uh, started to, to use and apply before evaluate the negative effect. So there is one imbalance between the, there is one, it's still unclear, in fact, what nanoparticle I can use or not, in which situation, with concentration. So there are big debate in this field. But the use, release of nanomaterial, nanomaterials have preceded the evaluation of the risk in the ecosystem. And there is no special regulation for the use, the storage the, of the nanomaterials. Why nanoparticles um, can offer some risk to the ecosystem? As I told, could be toxic only because the size. I show some examples. But the uptake and mobility of nanoparticles is greater than the large particles. The biological barriers are not prepared to block nanoparticle. Nanoparticle can pass through the biological barriers, can translocate to the cell membranes. And another important issue is related to the bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Most of nanomaterials are not biodegradable. And if nanoparticles enter in the organism, in a low food chain, the next 
uh, uh, chain, the organism can accumulate nanoparticles. This is the bioaccumulation and biomagnification. So, why nanoparticles in plants? Well, plants are in the ecosystem, connected to the air, to the soil, to the water supply, and of course, you need to investigate in plants, the effect of nanoparticles in plants. Not only in plants, but in plants. Here, uh, I'm going to show a few examples of uh, some works that evaluate the potential risk of nanoparticles for different plants, use different nanomaterials, and testing in different plants. Here, you can see that zinc oxide, iron oxide, can inhibit the germination in root elongation. Here is the Arabidopsia. The plant is Arabidopsia. Another kind of nanoparticle here, so it's clear that the root can be inhibited, the elongation of the root as well is a different material. Here is the germination process in the root elongation of zinc and zinc oxide. You can see that zinc can inhibit, but of course, depends on the concentration. If you look here, you can see that 2 ppm, they can improve the root elongation. So it's unclear the effects of nanoparticles in most of the biological system in plants as well. So it depends on the concentration. Nanoparticle can be beneficial or not. Here, it's another example that, that carbon nanotubule can uh, improve the growth of the plants and the germination. You can see here the tomato submitted it to the carbon nanotubule that improved the growth. Just one example in mammalian cells, the nanoparticles also can damage the cells. I will not go to the details, but just to show some examples. And here, one example of biomagnification. The leaves of tobacco was submitted to the gold nanoparticle. I think that's gold. Yes, gold nanoparticle. In a low concentration. And the worm was eating, eating, eating a lot of leaves. And the concentration of gold nanoparticles in the worms, it's much, much higher. OK? So could be a problem, the biomagnification. And about the translocation and the penetration of the nanoparticles, there are some experiments, some papers, showing that nanoparticles can be uptake, translocate, and go to the leaves and accumulate in the leaves. There is some papers showing. Here is one showing that nanoparticles can be easily translocated in the plants from the bottom to the top. Here it's another example using the oxide, iron oxide nanoparticles. In fact, there are a lot of research starting to investigate the potential effect of nanoparticles on edible plants. Okay, but there are a lot of open questions in this field. But there are some experiment, some papers show that nanoparticle could could be toxic, could inhibit the root elongation can inhibit the germination, but most of the, the papers, most of the studies involve only plants in the early stage of the development. You need to move forward to investigate, even in a situation that the plant 
is able to germinate, grow, but nanoparticles are located in the leaves. Photosynthesis can, can be uh, changed by the presence of uh, nanoparticles. The crop production could be affected by the presence of nanoparticles internalized in the leaves. How nanoparticles can play with chlorophyll in this process or other photosynthetic pigments? Okay. There are a lot of open questions about the changes in the photosynthetic capacity of plants, light uptake, light capture by plants, water supply, transpiration, and also about the toxicity. Because that, we now, we are interested to investigate if nanoparticles can alter, can change the photosynthetic activity of plants and I am showing here some example of the data used, collected using no, a silver nanoparticle, and I try to show why we choose silver. Silver is the most used nanoparticles in the commercial, in the product that has uh, nanoparticles, especially because silver is good for it's to against a microorganism. It's very, very used, silver, because of that. And just one uh, additional information here to, to show that nanoparticles could be started to uh, go to the environment. The researchers get some uh, clothes that nanopart silver nanoparticles are inserted in the clothes for the beneficial applications, of course, and wash the clothes. Only during the first washing cycle, up to 35% of nanoparticles goes out with the water washing water. So the water treatment are not able to remove nanoparticles. It's one indication that nanoparticles start to go to the environment. Even in the situation, it's here, only one washing, okay? So just to show that you need to, to be aware and investigate deeply the, the beneficial and the potential uh, issues related to the nanoparticles. Recently, we demonstrated that uh, silver nanoparticles can be toxic, mutagenic, cytotoxic for the, the plants in the early stage as well, okay? And the size is very, very important the smaller nanoparticle was more toxic, but as I told, we want to go to the adult plant, not only in the early stage. So I start to show some results using chlorophyll fluorescence imaging to evaluate the photosynthetic activity of plants in the presence of nanoparticles. As we wanted one controlled concentration. You injected the nanoparticle in the leaves. It's not a realistic way, but it's important to, to get one close relation between concentration and the effect. Here, this image is, is showing the FV, FM parameter that is closely related to the function of photosystem 2. And this spot is is showing that in this region, the photosystem 2 is not working properly. The plant is not in producing energy properly. And different parameters are obtained. Here, it's showing that the loss of energy by heating 
it's growing in the presence of nanoparticles, and the photochemistry capacity of the plants to produce sugar, it's going down. And we also evaluated the gas exchange, and the CO2 assimilation also was affected. So the photosynthesis depends of the CO2. If the CO2 assimilation is going down, the photosynthesis is not working well. And here is the stomatal conductance. It's related to the open and closing of the stomatus in the leaves. It's not working well as well. Here, you identified some micro damage in the leaf epiderm induced by silver nanoparticles. And we will also determine the, the ROS production inside the leaves. And as you can see, the presence of nanoparticles start to increase the production of uh, ROS. So it's very, very reactive. It can be toxic for the plant in excess. In the end of the story, I just would like to show you that, OK, you need to evaluate different biological system and asking which concentration you can use, which size, which shape can be used, because most of the, the people that work with nanoparticle only think in the beneficial application. It's OK, no problem. But some scientists should investigate, must investigate the, the harmful potential of nanoparticle. OK? Just a few slides for the end. Here is the conclusion uh, as I presented. Silver nanoparticle may, might negatively affect the photosynthesis activity, especially altering the function of photosystem two. The gas exchanged was affected as well. The CO2 assimilation was reduced, and the photosynthetic capacity of the leaves was reduced. This is very important because the crop production, it's quite dependent. It's very dependent of the photosynthetic activity in the leaves. Even the plants can grow, but when submitted to nanoparticle, the plants may not work properly to produce energy. And of course, the crop production will be reduced. And the economy could be impacted. Here. And just to show other others' um, works in the biophotonic areas, Alessandra and Cicera will be present some efforts that you are going, you, we are doing in Mato Grosso State to control the larval population, uh, Aedes aegypti larval population. And Cynthia will show tomorrow, I think so, some work involving the photodynamic inactivation as well. And would like, I'd like to, to acknowledge the uh, funding agents and the financial support of ENOF. The chlorophyll fluorescence system was implemented, implemented in Mato Grosso Sul State due to the financial support of ENOF. Here are some of my collaborators, Professor Samuel, Matheus Sul, Walter, from Federal University of Goiás, Pablo, Eduardo, Professor Vanderlei, Natalia, Kleber, and the Professor Ian and Trace from University of Essex. Okay, thank you for attention. I'm open for questions.
Thank you so much, Professor. Questions? Uh, in, in using the nanoparticles as uh, inhibitors in plants, what's the mechanism between the nanoparticles and the plants that you have been using? And it's it depend of the composition of the nanoparticles, but the silver nanoparticle, there are two important mechanisms. One, it's related to the ion liberation, and because silver can liberate ions, and the, it's this, the ions is, uh, are very toxic and can destroy the cells, and the ROS production, because the nanoparticle, due to the high superficial area related to the volume of the nanoparticles, the ROS production can, as I showed here, can be one problem. It depends on the nanoparticle, but the silver can say you that it's related to the ROS generation, the reactive space of oxygen, and the IO liberation, but it depends on the nanoparticles. Questions? Professor, thank you for your talk. Uh, what do you think has a bigger impact on this effect? Size or concentration? And the other part will be, is it possible to define a threshold? Size, it's very important, and the concentration as well. Uh, the, the big problem in this field today why there is no regulation about the use of nanoparticle? Because each biological system behaves different when interact with nanoparticles. It's very hard to define, oh, only it's allowed it to use nanoparticles higher than 50 and the concentration below, but uh, depends on the application. It's very, very hard. To, to, to have one legislation, to produce one legislation because of that. But it's possible for each application you define one safe condition. Okay, I can use silver nanoparticle, but for depends of the application, size higher than and concentration lower than. It's, it's one balance. But in the, in the process using light, it's possible you, you can get uh, good effects using lower concentration. It's very important when you, has, you can use light to induce the process because as a chemical, sometimes you need to a higher concentration to, uh, to, to get the effect. But uh, using light, you can reduce the, the concentration. I don't know exactly to to answer, oh, this, in this situation I can use it or not, but you need to investigate. And because of that, it's too hard to, to have one regulation, one general regulation to the use of nanoparticles. Thank you. One more question? No? Okay, Natalia, Natalia, here. presentation and interesting uh, work. Um, I would like to know if uh, you are interested uh, or if you think that uh, you can give uh, an insight about the mechanism. Uh, if we have uh, uh, some uh, uh, NIR fluorescent uh, uh, compounds linked to the nanoparticles. Because I have some in my lab, uh, and, and I, I mentioned I'm really concerned yeah. about about this uh, type of toxicity. And uh, if you think that uh, maybe uh, it would be more easy to, to visualize by fluorescence this type yeah. of uh, especially I have some, uh, yeah. in, in the case of metal nanoparticles, uh, we have one phenomenal 
called the plasma resonance that is some molecules near the metal nanoparticles can improve uh, their optical properties because the electrons in the surface of the metal can oscillate and if we found one, one frequency that you can do the electrons o oscillate collectively, the oscillation of the electrons will generate, will generate one additional field. So for the system, it's like the local intensity, local intensity is enhanced, and the fluorophore uh, near or the molecular near the surface can be enhanced the number of the electrons that will be excited and the optical process sometimes depend of the excited electrons in most of the cases and you, 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 you can improve the optical properties. But would you be interested in uh, checking some of uh, our compounds just uh, to Yes, of course. To because yeah, we yes. have carbon nanotubes from Celise with uh, yes, uh, of course orphans and thalocyanins. We have magnetic nanoparticles. Uh, we put a silica coating and after we... Yes. We, uh, and so uh, we are using them as yeah, no, but we are interested to, to perform. Uh, yes, yes. To you can send what me. They can do to the environment. Yes, okay. you can we, send us we, and we you can perform. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? No. I have one last question, uh, Anderson. You said something about testing clearance of nanoparticles, testing in plants, right? Are you aware of any sort of study doing that in human beings or in mammals, anything like this, or in placenta, like if they go through placenta, any sort of these studies? Yes, there are some uh, papers in this, in this uh, attacking this issue um, I can't remember right now one example, but in different uh, aquatic organism, in I don't know if in vivo, in human, but in cells, there are some papers. And the effect is very similar to the, the effects in plant cells. It's, it's, but uh, the nanoparticles can easily, easily go through the cells. One more. Oh. Thank you again, Professor.